Hi, this is Craig Stocks here for Utah Desert Remote Observatories. You can find us online at utahdesertremote.com. And today I want to finish processing this image of the Elephant Trunk Nebula and really focusing on how we can use smart objects in Photoshop. <music> So a few days ago, I processed this image of the Elephant Trunk Nebula and did a speed run where I went through PixInsight and Photoshop uh, more or less as quickly as I could uh, to get a, a, a good semi-finished image. Uh, but there's still more we can do to it, and that's what I want to focus on today. So we're not going to spend any time today in PixInsight. This is all going to be focused on Photoshop and what else we might want to do to fine-tune this image. So it, I mean, it's really not bad uh, as a starting point. Uh, and just to recap, we have several layer groups. And we have a layer group for sulfur, one for oxygen, one for hydrogen. And those are in the layers palette over here on the right-hand side. And then we have some global adjustments for um, using a levels adjustment, which it, we can use to adjust overall brightness and contrast a color balance that we can change the color balance and hue saturation if we want to increase saturation and those are global adjustments those are not inside any of the layer groups uh, so for instance if I change the color balance uh, that changes the color balance of the entire image uh, which frequently that's something that you might want to do we separated the stars in PixInsight so we have the stars as a separate layer group and that's in screen blending mode. And we're using screen blending mode because we used the unscreen method of removing the stars in PixInsight using Star Exterminator. And if we look at what's inside this layer group, we have the, the layer that's the stars by itself. And over on the left-hand side, we have the eyeballs. So for instance, I can turn an individual layer or layer group on and off. If I alt click or that on a Mac, that would be option click on the eyeball that will turn off everything but that layer. So there's just the stars. And then we have a levels adjustment layer and a hue saturation. And I tend to find that you really have to pump up the saturation of the stars uh, once you put it against a, a colorful SHO background. Uh, so you know, we pumped up the saturation in PixInsight, and then I typically will pump it up again in Photoshop. Uh, sometimes, and this one may be an example, uh, the blue is starting to become a little bit overwhelming. So we might want to use the drop down to look at the individual colors, target just the blues, and reduce the blue saturation. I find also a lot of times the red stars tend to be a little overwhelming. So I frequently will target the reds and remove just red saturation in the stars. Now since this adjustment layer is within a layer group that's in screen blending mode, this is only affecting the stars. It's not affecting anything else. So where this hue saturation is outside of any layer group and it's a global hue saturation that affects everything below it. This one that's within the stars group affects just the color saturation of the stars and not the nebula below. So let's close that and let's just turn this off for now. Let's look at the individual red or sulfur, hydrogen, and oxygen. And let's start with the sulfur. And I just opened up that layer group, and you can see that inside the sulfur layer group, there's a levels adjustment layer, and then there's a the layer itself. And again, if I alt-click on just that layer, there's the sulfur layer <clears throat> as it came from PixInsight. And of course, it's a monochrome image, so it's just in black and white. And if I alt-click on that again, it'll turn everything back on. And just as a quick refresher where the color comes from, each one of these images is a monochrome image, just like the sulfur. Where color comes from 
if we look at the oxygen layer, this little icon over on the right tells us that there's a layer style or blending options applied. And if I double click on the, this would apply to either a layer or a layer group to the right of the name, that will open up those blending options. And we can see, looking here in the center, that the red channel is turned off. So this layer group is only passing green and blue through. And the red comes from whatever's below it, which in this case is sulfur. And in fact, if I turn off, let's just turn the ones off above it, <clears throat> just the sulfur and oxygen is really an SOO image. And if I turn off just the oxygen, you can see there's the black and white. There it is an SOO. If I target the levels adjustment in within the oxygen, so now I'm adjusting that green and blue to make it brighter or darker. And this curves adjustment layer I use to adjust the color of the cyan. And like many of the others, there's a drop down where we can target the red, green, or blue channel. So if we target the green channel's curve, you can see I've lowered the right hand side. And what that's doing is taking green out of the cyan and changing the, the color mix of the uh, SOO image. And I find that's fairly typical. I'll make it an SOO, but then I'll take some of the green out to you know, give it a little bit more blue. Now, something else we notice if we look at the, this SOO, you can see that we've got a, a big fuzzy spot here on the left, the, kind of in the lower left. And if I turn the stars on for a second, you can see that, well, actually there is a bright star there. So what we're probably picking up is some glow or some star removal residual from that star. And there's probably some around this bright star here as well. Let's turn this, and yeah, you can see some there. So that's one of the first things we might want to address. And there's a lot of different ways we can address that. Let's just zoom in. And when we zoom in, you can really see there's kind of a smudge there. Um, that's not, you know, if you're trying to be perfectly scientifically accurate, that's not what was there but we don't know what was there because it was hidden behind the glare of the star. So we want to remove the, that smudge. A couple different ways we could go about doing it. One would be to grab the remove tool and just click here. And now notice I'm on that oxygen layer. So if I click there, it will remove that fuzzy patch and fill it in as, as intelligently as it can with what was around it. And that works That works pretty well. Uh, let's try it up here, see if we can remove that. And yeah, that cleaned that up also. We might also want to do some sharpening. And let's start with the sulfur layer. So I'm going to turn off oxygen and look at the sulfur. Uh, there's a fair amount of noise and some uh, artifacts from my darks being out of date, so just ignore that for the time being. If we want to apply some sharpening, uh, we did deconvolution sharpening in PixInsight, but, but if we want to do creative sharpening, uh, we would do that here. The tool I like to use in Photoshop is called Smart Sharpen, but we want to be smart about how we apply a filter like that because a sharpening filter can be very non-destructive, or very destructive, I should say, and we want to do it non-destructively. Photoshop has a, a whole set of tools built around smart objects that we can use for non-destructive editing. And the first thing we need to do is convert a layer into a smart object. And a smart object basically encapsulates the original source information uh, whether it's a one layer or multiple layers into a single smart object that you can then apply filters to. There's two big advantages to a smart object. The first is that we can then apply filters as smart filters. And what a smart filter does is let you, much like you do with an adjustment layer, you can go back and adjust the settings of that filter non-destructively and you never change the original source image. 
Uh, the other advantage is you can, if you can open up that smart object and go back to the original source data. So let's just play with that here on the sulfur layer. I'm going to right click to the right of the layer name and select convert to smart object. And the only change we'll notice is the layer thumbnail now has a little badge indicating that this is a smart object rather than just a plain layer. So now if I apply the Smart Sharpen filter, if I go to Filter, Sharpen, and Smart Sharpen, so far everything works just like it did before. And just click OK, and it will apply that filter to sharpen this layer. And the, the progress bar is over on my other screen. It's done now. And so we can see it has added some sharpening. Uh, it may have added too much sharpening in some of these areas that are more noise than, than detail. Notice that the Smart Filter has its own mask. That's what this white rectangle represents. And when I click on that mask, you'll notice there's a, a double outline around the mask. So I can use the brush tool Tap B for the brush tool, and 100% opacity, black is my foreground color. I can paint with black and hide that sharpening selectively from areas where all it's really doing is applying noise. And you can see on the thumbnail now, you can see where I painted with black. If I accidentally paint with black somewhere that I didn't want to, all I have to do is switch the colors so that white is my foreground and I can do that with either the, the curved arrow or tapping X on the keyboard and now when I paint with white I'm painting that effect back in. Now the beauty of a smart object is twofold. If we decide that well we want to change our sharpening settings I can double click on this layer thumbnail and it opens as a separate document. You notice we're on a new tab now. This is that original file. And if we zoom in, we can start to see, well, there's actually some, some places where we have other star removal uh, residual noise. And maybe we want to use the uh, spot healing brush to clean those up. So we can go around on this original layer. And the spot healing brush, by the way, does not work on the smart object itself. You have to open it as a pixel bearing layer for this tool to work. But we can clean up some of these artifacts. And when we're done, all I have to do is use the X on the tab to close <clears throat> this file. And it will ask me if I want to save it. And when I say yes, what it's going to do is not save this as a separate file. It's going to save this file with these changes back into that smart object. So now the smart object will be updated with those edits that we just made. So we saw two things that we can do with a smart object. We can apply a smart filter and then go back and change the smart filter in the future. And you can save the document, open it tomorrow, and do the same thing as long as you save it as a native PSD or a large format PSB file. And then the other thing we can do, of course, is, is access that original data uh, by double-clicking on the file. Now, we've got a fair amount of noise going on here in some of these areas, and so we want to actually apply some noise reduction specifically in these areas. But we've already applied a Smart Sharpen filter, and we've already used the one mask that comes with a smart object. And that would apply no matter how many filters we applied. Uh, you know, we could apply a, a noise filter, but it would be within this same smart object group and with that same mask already applying to it. And we want to do something different. So what I'm going to do is convert this smart object into another smart object. So in effect, we're nesting smart objects. So I'll right click, convert to smart object, so now we have a smart object made from a smart object. Nothing wrong with that. And now I can go to Filter, Noise, Dust and Scratches. And we can use this to create some 
some noise blurring effect that we'll apply in this background area that's, that's really not much but noise. Uh, if we click on the mask, we can see that it's all white, meaning that this filter is applied everywhere. Uh, probably the easiest thing is to invert this so that it's applied nowhere. In other words, we'll turn the mask black. So to invert that mask, we can control I. Now that's not applied anywhere. I'll grab my brush tool with white as my foreground color and just paint this noise removal in in areas where we don't have a lot of detail. And that cleans that up. And if we zoom in, we can see there are some areas where we have noise very close to detail. So I'll make the brush smaller and paint in these areas. And you can see one problem, that it's actually becomes too smooth. So to correct that, let's go to Filter, Noise, Add Noise. And we'll add, and usually with this camera, it's somewhere around 8 or 10. Uh, percent noise and that will blend the noise that we're adding with the uh, I had since I'm still on the on the mask it actually added that noise filter to the mask and that's not what we want to do so I've already undone that I want to click on the smart object and do filter noise add noise and now we're adding that noise to the smart object and so we're smoothing it with the dust and scratches filter and then we're adding noise to blend it in and now you can see that the areas where we have painted away that noise blends in very nicely Oops. And you can make your brush smaller and work into you know, as, as fine a details as you want. And this is very useful when you're working with um, you know, removing noise or star removal artifacts very close to other details. And you don't want to just blur the details, but you do want to use this tool to clean up some of that noise. So you, know, you could spend uh, minutes or hours doing this on an individual image, just depending on how much energy and perfection you want to try to put into an image. So we'll quit there for the time being. But now we've cleaned up this sulfur layer quite a bit. Uh, we can turn the oxygen layer on and we may want to do the same thing to the oxygen. So let's go to the oxygen layer, right click, convert to smart object, and then we'll add our sharpening filter, sharpen, smart sharpen. And I know from experience these are roughly appropriate settings, but because these are smart filters, I can always come back and change them in the future. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not really committing to this level of sharpening. I'm just committing to having sharpening applied. And lastly, let's go to the hydrogen. If you recall, hydrogen is in screen blending mode, and we're using this curves layer in color blending mode to tweak the color of the hydrogen. And let's do the same thing. Let's convert it to a smart object, and let's apply sharpening. And so now we've added a fair amount of sharpening to all three layers. Uh, if we need to, we can individually adjust the amount of sharpening on each one of those layers. We can add noise or remove noise layer by layer. Um, you can see there's still some noise showing through here, probably from the sulfur. So we can come back to sulfur and see if we paint on this mask with white. Oh, no, that's, that may be in the oxygen. Yep, that's, a lot of that's in the oxygen. So we may want to do the same thing with oxygen. We'll, again, convert our smart object into a smart object. And we're doing this mostly so we can manage the mask separately. We'll add noise, 
or I'm sorry, we'll apply dust and scratches. We'll invert that mask and then we'll paint with white on that mask to clean up that noise that's coming from the oxygen layer. And generally I'm trying to stay away from areas with a lot of detail. And like we did before, we probably want to add some noise so that it blends nicely. <clears throat> so we'll come back to a filter noise, add noise, and that keeps everything homogeneous. So now we're back up to our global adjustments. This makes the this is being used to darken the image overall. We have a color balance image that we're using to, to fine tune the color balance. And if we want to bring out more red, uh, like we did before, we can always come back to sulfur, which is where red is coming from, and boost the brightness of the red. And that will add more red, more sulfur into the image. Here's a global hue saturation, which is a little too strong now, so we probably want to back it down. And now we're back to being able to turn our stars back on. So let's turn on the stars. And let's play with the stars a little bit. We can do two things here, uh, maybe a couple things. Uh, there's a lot of stars visible, and I tend to find a lot of small stars are a distraction. And we're using the screen blending mode. The other mode you can use is lighten. And so let's change to lighten blending mode. And for the most part, the stars look better. The colors come through a little bit better and they're smaller overall, but we lose the impact of some of the larger stars. So let me zoom out and let's just compare that with screen blending mode. This is lighten blending mode. But there's no reason we can't use a combination of the two. So let's just duplicate this entire group. And I can do that with Control J or Command J on a Mac. And let's put the top copy of the stars in screen blending mode. And then let's add a layer mask. And targeting the layer mask will invert the mask. So now that is completely hidden. And now let's go to some of these bright stars and we'll grab our brush tool and we'll just put a white spot on the mask to let the screened star show through. And that brings some of these bright stars back out. And so it's just a matter of working your way around the, the image and more or less picking the stars that you really want to let shine. And usually that means for me looking for the brighter stars and putting those back into screen blending mode. And I usually find that I don't want both. So what I'll do, uh, we've got this mask, which is masking the screen blending mode stars. Let's copy this mask down to the lighten layer stars. And we can copy a mask. If you just drag it, it will move the mask from one layer to another. And that's not what we want to do. If I hold the alternate key when I drag that mask, it will copy the mask. And now I can control I and invert this mask. And so now we have just stars that are screened and just stars that are in light and blending mode. And we may want to individually adjust the brightness of those stars. Uh, once they're in light and blending mode, we might want to brighten them up a little bit and just find an overall good balance. The other thing you may notice is where you have a lot of nebula light and bl light and blending mode won't show the stars at all. So that's not too much of a problem on this one. 
uh, on some nebulae you need to use the screen blending mode to bring the stars out when they're on top of a bright part of the nebula. So at this point we're in pretty good shape on this image. Uh, I might adjust the saturation a little bit. Uh, I might play with the color balance a little bit. Uh, but overall we're probably at a point where we could say this is a, a, a pretty well completed image and we're ready to, to save it and move on to the next step. Now in the next video what I'm going to do is we're going to collect more data because this is just one night's data. Um, this is about three hours I think of data on the elephant trunk. What I'm going to do is go back and collect more data uh, and then we will add that to this image using the power of smart objects. So I hope you found this useful. If you have any questions, be sure to drop them in the comments down below. And as always, I hope you have a great day today and an even better night tonight under a clear, dark sky. Thanks. Mm -hmm.